Hey everyone, it's Rod. If you're new to the channel, hey, I'm Rod. I'm a Paraguayan currently living in Switzerland. And I decided to make a YouTube channel where I share a mix of things, such as my viewpoints about certain topics, uh, reviews about the products I use, and life experiences that I've had that I believe are worth sharing. Let's jump into the topic of today, coffee. Coffee is one of the most widely consumed drinks around the world, probably because it increases attentiveness and also because it reduces sleepiness. In everyday life, you will hear both good and bad things about coffee. Many times, for example, when people saw me drinking coffee, they gave me the comment, oh, be careful with drinking coffee. Not only it can become addictive, but also it may increase your risk of heart disease, negatively affect your digestion and even dehydrate you. And I believe these comments are based on relatively old scientific research that has been done many decades ago. I made a little bit of research about this topic and I would like to share with you the different scientific papers I found that talk about the various effects of coffee consumption on our health. However, before I want to do that, I want to emphasize that if you are interested in this topic, you should also probably do your own research about it because it's very likely that I missed out on some relevant studies that may counter argue the ones that I will mention throughout this video. Lastly, I will share all the links to all the studies I mentioned in the video description down below in case you want to go and read them later. Let's jump right in. The first study I want to mention is a 1981 study done by McMahon and co-authors where they found a strong association between coffee consumption and pancreatic cancer. And that's for both males and females. This association was not affected by controlling for cigarette use. Now, in scientific terms, what does controlling for cigarette use mean? That to, to try to make it simple, controlling for cigarette use means that uh, they also took into account the effects of smoking. And by controlling for cigarette smoking, that means that they, they were able to isolate the effect that was purely attributed to the consumption of coffee on our health. The authors say, however, that their findings should be compared with other data in order to confirm some causal relation between coffee drinking and pancreatic cancer, which, if they are right, coffee consumption may contribute to a significant proportion of the cases of such disease in the United States. Again, I want to emphasize, though, that this is a 1981 study, which is already 40 years old. A 1999 study by Corpella and co-authors focused on the effects of coffee and blood pressure and they found that a high intake of coffee and caffeine increases blood pressure. Hence, they conclude that regular coffee could potentially be damaging to high hypertension prone individuals. A 1994 study by Stemsfold and Jacobsen examined around 22,000 men and 22,000 women aged between 35 and 54 years old in a 10-year complete follow-up and they found no relationship between coffee consumption and the overall risk of cancer. However, they did find a positive relationship between coffee consumption and the risk of lung cancer, even after taking age and smoking cigarettes into account. That is, in scientific terms, after controlling for these two variables. So based on these studies, it's quite evident that coffee is actually harmful to us. But now let's look at relatively more recent research. Current research seems to provide evidence that actually supports the moderate consumption of coffee. For example, a 2008 study by Lopez Garcia and co-authors took into account 42,000 men and 86,000 women with no history of cardiovascular disease or cancer at baseline. And they assessed their coffee consumption every two to four years from 1986 to 2004 for men and from 1980 to 2004 for women. And what they found was no statistically significant association between the risk of cancer death and coffee consumption, even after controlling for other variables. They did find, however, that the caffeinated coffee consumption was correlated with a small reduction in all cause and CBD mortality. Another paper by Ross and co-authors studied 8,000 men aged 45 and 68 and analyzed them with 30 years of follow-up. They found that a high coffee and caffeine consumption is associated with a significantly lower occurrence of Parkinson's disease. And this is regardless of whether the individual is a smoker or not. Now, this other study is also very interesting. Van Damme and Feskins studied a population-based cohort of 17,000 Dutch men and women aged 30 to 60 years old. 
and they found something quite interesting. Higher consumption of coffee was associated with male sex, a low educational level, a higher body mass index, cigarette smoking, alcohol use, less leisure time physical activity, and generally a less favorable diet. At the same time, however, they found out that higher coffee consumption was associated with a lower risk of type 2 diabetes. And results remain essentially the same when they adjusted for tea and food tea intake, excluded uses of the caffeinated coffee, and also excluded persons without any coffee consumption. So let's go back a little bit and try to understand what this study basically says. So they basically found a strong correlation between coffee consumption and the male sex, a low educational level, higher body mass index, cigarette smoking, alcohol consumption, excluding the fact that people that were male are most likely to drink coffee than females, all these variables that I just mentioned are normally associated with bad healthy habits, right? But the authors then find something surprising that those who actually drank coffee, which normally are men that have a bad eating habits, don't do exercise, and tend to smoke and drink alcohol, they found that even after taking these people into account, coffee consumption was actually associated with a lower risk of type 2 diabetes, which is quite surprising and interesting, I would say. There is this other 2009 review from Andre Nkondjok, who wrote a very well-written summary about coffee consumption and the risk of cancer, and he provides an extremely good summary and actually encouraged you to go and read it. He wrote a summary of various studies that talk about breast, prostate, colorectal, ovary, pancreatic, kidney, and liver cancer. And based on the studies that this author mentions, he concludes that there's a good amount of scientific research playing actually in favor of coffee consumption against the risk of cancer. The author says that there's a growing body of epidemiological investigations suggesting that coffee drinking does not have a harmful effect. Instead, coffee consumption may be inversely associated with the risk of kidney, liver, and to a lesser extent, breast and colorectal cancer. So even though the few studies I just mentioned are portraying a quite favorable view towards coffee consumption, we should not just stop there. For example, let me ask you this question. How is the effect of coffee consumption associated with, let's say, pregnant women? A meta-analysis from August 2015 by Lee and co-authors evaluated the association between pregnancy loss and caffeine and coffee consumption during pregnancy. The studies they took into account have shown that caffeine consumption during pregnancy are significantly associated with pregnancy loss. So basically, pregnant women are more likely to have pregnancy loss the more coffee and caffeine they consume. Again, according to this study. Another important issue with regards to coffee that we need to discuss is dehydration. What does the scientific literature say about it? Killer and Blanning in their 2014 paper, they find that coffee did not result in dehydration when provided in a moderate dose of four milligrams per kilogram of body weight caffeine in four cups per day. Thus, the data suggests that coffee, when consumed in moderation by caffeine-habituated males, contributes daily fluid requirement and does not pose a detrimental effect to fluid balance. The advice provided in the public health domain regarding coffee intake and hydration status should therefore be updated to reflect these settings. So even though this study claims that coffee does not dehydrate you, but does the opposite instead, I would still use water as the best way to stay hydrated. Now, another variable that we have to take into account is sleep deprivation. This is an aspect we need to look at when evaluating the effects of coffee consumption on us. According to Clark and Landlord's paper published in 2017, by blocking the adenosine neuromodulator and receptor system, which contributes importantly to sleep-wake regulation, caffeine impairs nighttime sleep at least in vulnerable individuals. The effect of caffeine containing one or two double espressos ingested up to 16 hours before sleep induced reliable changes in the sleep EEG. EEG is a non-invasive test that records electrical patterns in your brain. And this test shows that the more coffee you take, you have more superficial sleep. Although the caffeine level in saliva has virtually reverted to zero at the beginning of the sleep. And then the authors go even further and consider the consequences that sleepiness may bring in everyday life. 
stating that sleep hygiene practice contribute to increased health risk, although awareness of this practice in the general public may be lacking. Okay, so after having thrown at you all this amount of research, let's go back to the question this video is trying to answer. Is coffee bad for you? But most of the recent studies mentioned here find that there's no correlation between daily coffee consumption of three to four cups of coffee and health risk. Some studies go even further and say that there may be a negative relationship between these two variables. Again, coffee consumption and health risk. What do I mean by health risk? The risk of several types of cancer, Parkinson disease, CBD and type 2 diabetes. Some of these studies claim that even after taking into account other variables such as eating, drinking and smoking habits, also whether the individual does sports or not and so on, the authors still affirm that they are able to find an inverse effect of coffee consumption on health risk. Should we believe the findings from these studies? Personally, I think there's still room for further research about the topic. In the meantime, I will still consume coffee to help me get through the day and not fall asleep when I'm working. If the current literature is right about the positive effects of coffee on health, then great. And also as someone who drinks coffee three to four times per day, I am aware that I need to kind of decrease my coffee consumption a little bit because on average, everything in excess is not good for you. So yeah guys, I try to make this video as objective as possible without allowing my coffee addiction to influence the content that I, sh I share with you. I have a question for you. What is your opinion about the effects of coffee and caffeine on health. Do you think the current literature is actually right? Or do you think the impact of, of coffee and caffeine on health still needs way more research to have a clearer image? I'm really interested to hear what your take on this topic is. And I thank you so much for your time and I hope, I hope to see you on the next one. Bye.